All right, it's nice to be here. Uh, I was going to uh, start by saying I'm going to stand still because a uh, fun, funny story is that yesterday I was going to a meeting. I'm the medical director for behavioral health for Solano County in Northern California. And I was going to a meeting. My colleague has a Jeep Wrangler, and I went. She, we went to get in her car, and I was stepped up high. And when I got to get out of her car, of course, my back was not happy. Something happened. So I'll be fine in three days. But uh, I, I have acute pain, uh, so I laugh about it. But it's nice to be here. Um, my brother was an RA at the building right there when he went to UCLA. So I've been down here. And um, of course, we had AHS 11 here. So I was going to tell a little backstory. So in 2007, uh, I started a blog, Healthcare Epistemocrat, and was having fun writing. But mostly, the best part was connecting with new people. And so I met Aaron. Um, and that was wonderful, and many other people. And in two, December of 2009, Aaron and I came here to UCLA to a conference called New Directions in Physiology. And it was a good conference, and um, we were also joined by our friend Chris Owens at the time. And after the conference, we were like, why don't we have our own conference? There's like all these people at the time we had connected with through different blogs and activities on the internet, and we were hoping to, uh, almost similar to now, take all the interactions online and bring people together in person and have a gathering that would bring together in kind of an egalitarian way um, that supports diversity and inclusivity and uh, discussion of ideas. Um, the whole spectrum, so lay people with lived experience all the way to scientists and physicians. And so, you know, I had uh, appreciated Nassim Taleb's idea for the envelope of serendipity, and I put on my blog a post after the conference saying, you know, we like to do this conference, and we just literally just posted the idea. And fortunately, Jake was reading my blog at the time and said, you know, if you do it, I'll help you out. And that's really how we got to today, because then from there, we had, like we still have, is a group of people who are passionate, volunteer, work together as a team to form the nonprofit, to bring together all the presenters who were passionate and eager to, you know, contribute. And then by August 2011, you know, we had the first conference. So here we are 11 years later, so it's pretty phenomenal. Um, and then I went down the hole of going to medical school. So, <laughs> so it, I mean, I remember I, I came to the conference in 2011. It was early August, and I think within the next week or two, I was in Baltimore, and it rained for 21 days, and I was doing anatomy. So things changed rapidly, obviously, for me. But you know, one thing I was going to talk about today that's interesting is as I went through my journey at Hopkins and becoming a doctor and becoming a psychiatrist is finding mentors there working in chronic pain who essentially were stumbling upon and utilizing similar tools that people have been talking about at AHS for the last 11 years. Um, so really, you know, I think that uh, pain, chronic pain, is an interesting area of medicine because it uh, requires a very holistic approach. There's a lot that we don't know. It's very individualized, and there's a lot of different tools people can use to manage pain and chronic pain um, to help them function and you know have quality of life. So, my mentor at Hopkins, uh, who I give a lot of credit to, is uh, Dr. Glenn Treisman. Um, and he talks about interstitial medicine. You know, there's, there's different areas where, you know, clearly patients are suffering or dealing with certain problems that lie at the intersection or in between the spaces of the specialties that we have in medicine because we have such a siloed, specialty-driven healthcare system and the way things work. But clearly, 
everyone here can appreciate and why we have AHS is that in that space, you know, that's where you need uh, creativity, you need an open mind, and you have to be able to, you know, collaborate among specialties and among, um, among the silos to bring people together. So to me, if you're gonna talk about chronic pain, ancestral health and interstitial medicine have a lot in common. So I'll share a little bit about what I've learned as a psychiatrist working in chronic pain. And just to show you, you'll see some things that you may have stumbled upon over the years in the ancestral health world. But one of the reasons why this topic is important um, is this problem, uh, which does exist uh, as a continuing challenge in our communities. So back in the 90s, you know, chronic pain is not a new thing, obviously. There was a big push to treat pain, and one idea that was proposed is thinking about pain as a vital sign. So you don't need pain to live. You need your vital signs to live. You need a pulse. You have to perfuse your organs. So you need a heart rate. You need a blood pressure. If you don't have those, you can't live. Uh, you need to oxygenate your blood. You need to ventilate your lungs. If you don't have a respiratory rate, if you don't have an O2 saturation, you can't live. You need those to live. You don't need pain to live. It's not a vital sign. But the push to make pain a vital sign within our healthcare system, before you know it, JACO and all the regulatory bodies made the pain one to 10 scale so important. And it started to kick off a cycle of utilizing opiates you know, widely to treat pain. And unfortunately, opiates, while they may help acute pain, and of course they have a role in medicine and they're very therapeutic and useful. We wouldn't be able to do the surgeries and all the things we can do that are definitely providing great value. But when it comes to long-term management of pain, for many people, opiates can be problematic because, as I'll talk about, is um, pain signals that are either amplified or malfunctioning don't go silent. They just get louder. So with opiates, which have a physiologic mechanism of essentially block, trying to block a, trans, a pain transmission signal, we see tolerance, escalation of pain, dose escalation of opiates. And we, we recognized that a few decades later, and then we wanted to cut doctors off from prescribing opiates. And it almost happened all of a sudden. So people still dealing with pain, dealing with opiate addiction, have found their sources of opiates, as you can see, fentanyl out in the community sourced from all different manners. And fentanyl, if you don't know, is much more potent. Um, it's laced in many street drugs at the time. And the big issue is the ease of taking too much without knowing it and overdosing and dying because your respiratory rate goes to zero. So this is a graph. Uh, you know, that was up to 2018 data, and I put a line in because basically, if you, if you go get recent data, this, the, op the uh, fentanyl line just keeps going to the moon. So uh, as a behavioral health medical director for a county, of course, this is something that's sad and continues to be a difficult epidemic. Uh, and then part of it, you know, is we don't have a healthcare system that's very good at managing people with chronic pain and with addiction. And there's room to improve. Um, but so if pain is not a vital sign, it's very important to realize that pain is an experience. So there's a lot of components to everyone's pain. And that's very important to be empathetic to and realize that pain has a sensory component, of course. Pain, you know, humans are sentient beings. We've evolved, fortunately pain transmission signals we can take in our environment, pain feedback shapes our behavior, helps us avoid aversive or noxious stimuli. Uh, but those systems can go awry. Um, but you can see how pain can be protective. And so a good example in medicine is take someone with, uh, with uncontrolled diabetes who unfortunately develops neuropathy in their foot, meaning the nerves in the foot 
are no longer sensing the environment properly. So someone like that is at risk as they're walking along, they get something on their foot, they get a breakdown in their skin tissue, they get an infection, they don't have the information being transmitted to their brain to modify their behavior to say, hey, I should check my foot, I have a wound. And people can get bad wound infections, then require amputation, and this is like a, a very sad progression. But clearly in this case, that lack of having that pain information is, um, is harmful. You need, I mean, so, so having pain systems that we have is a good thing, but just like any physiologic system, it can malfunction, it can provide misinformation, and it can, we have vulnerabilities as a result. And so when you experience pain, you have your sensory component, but there's a cognitive element. You know, pain is frustrating, it's distracting, it affects your concentration. Uh, there's a, you know, did I say cognitive or emotional? See, I have pain, I can't even remember what I just said. But so there's a cognitive, there's a cognitive component. Then there's emotional component, you know, pain. If you're in pain constantly, you know, of course it's gonna affect your mood. Um, and then your mood's gonna affect the inflammation in your body and that's gonna affect your, your pain experience. And we'll talk, I'll talk a little bit about, you know, of course in psychiatry, if someone has, you know, major depressive disorder and how that can affect their pain experience. Um, and a behavioral component because it's, it's gonna affect your mobility, it's gonna affect your daily activities, it's going to uh, condition you in certain ways without you even knowing it. So important thing to realize is pain, we wanna look at it holistically. It's not a scale of one to 10, it's not a vital sign. It's part of someone's life. Um, and if you work in mental health uh, for even a day, one thing, not that you don't get this elsewhere, but one thing you really quickly realize is that, you know, we have many vulnerabilities and our vulnerabilities um, when it comes to pain are going to feed back and you're gonna have cycles where comorbidities and pain create amplification loops. And so here's just a list of things that you might have heard about. I, um, but uh, when, you, when, you, when someone's experiencing pain, you wanna think about is, and when you're experiencing yourself, is how are things interacting um, to affect your pain experience? And here's a little more um, specific to opiates. So say someone is given an opiate for their pain, well, that's uh, probably going to um, block the pain for a short period of time, but then your body's gonna send an increased pain signal to the brain, and then you're gonna experience the same amount of pain that you had before. You're probably gonna be less active because opiates slow you down and you know, you're gonna be inactive, and we know inactivity begets more inactivity. And you can see that essentially the the message your body's sending to your brain saying, I'm in pain, I'm in pain, I'm in pain, the volume is gonna go up, up, up. The activities that you're gonna be able to do are gonna go down, 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 and you're gonna get into a feedback loop that is gonna you know, impair your function and lower quality of life, and unfortunately, a lot of people have been caught in this loop. Um, and then when they go to the doctor and they access care with this specialist or that specialist, depending on the specialty and how they deal with abstract kind of complaints like an experience of pain, uh, you're gonna find in healthcare that this kind of false dichotomy of pain kind of exists. So it's even present in the language we use. And if you look at just how neurology, for instance, nothing against neurology, but the, the, the words they will use to describe pain, and if you look in the literature, um, you know, you get this idea that somehow some people have real pain and some people have psychological or unreal pain or whatever. So one of the main things when I work with a patient is recognizing that everyone's pain is real because it's their experience. And this false dichotomy doesn't actually exist. It doesn't even make physiologic sense, but it is out there. And so people get the sense that somehow they fall on the right that they don't have a medical problem, they have this other problem. And um, unfortunately, you know, that gets perpetuated and it makes it frustrating for 
a person trying to access care to get support and treatment for a chronic pain experience. Um, so, partly why I think that there, you get this, you know, this is, this false pain dichotomy is kind of a reflexive way for a doctor who has a very specialized thing where they see this problem and they can fix it with this intervention. And if it falls outside that silo, then, well, it's kind of frustrating for them because they don't know what to do. Um, and this is a complicated thing. And I don't have enough time, so you got to, uh, you know, I don't know how to handle this. But partly because when we look at pain, as it presents to the healthcare system through people's complaints, experiences, symptoms, and everything they say is you have to really think through the differential diagnosis of someone's pain experience. And there's a whole spectrum of things that can be going on when you see a patient who's sharing about pain. So you could be in an ER and there's truly someone malingering pain symptoms because all they want is a narcotic. And that can happen. But that doesn't mean everyone's doing that. That's just one of the things on the differential diagnosis. You could be in the ER and someone comes in with pain, and it could be the other end of the spectrum. They've already been to 15 doctors, but they actually have like an undiagnosed medical condition, and that can be presenting similarly with the exact same you know, kind of constellation of signs and symptoms as the patient accesses care. So you really have to think across what I would call like an illness behavior spectrum, not in a negative connotation, just saying if someone has an illness or ailment or a pain syndrome and they're presenting with these behaviors and these uh, symptoms, you really have to get, take the time and energy to dig into the case, get to know the patient, know what medical workup's been done, be able to come up with a plan, work with people longitudinally, and all that I just said is almost longer than what a typical doctor visit takes. So making this happen is difficult in our healthcare systems. So, so this is where, you know, there's clearly external vulnerabilities to developing chronic pain syndromes, such as um, the pain amplification loop you can get caught in if you present with a pain complaint, someone gives you a narcotic, you come back, you're saying, I'm still in pain, they give you more narcotic. You know, there's external vulnerabilities that patients encounter that feed into the development of chronic pain syndrome. Similarly, pain is a vital sign was a big, is a big uh, example of something where some of this was conditioned on people without them even knowing by how we were operating our healthcare system. Um, but then also, each patient has their own in each person, we all have strengths, vulnerabilities, and some are adaptive in some environments and some are challenging in other environments, but everyone brings to the table vulnerabilities individually. And in psychiatry, you know, depression is a large vulnerability that we um, see, and if people have chronic pain and a, an affective illness, this is a big vulnerability to feeding back and amplifying pain experiences. And so treatment has to be holistic and, and, and oriented towards both. So for instance, you know, they've done research, people who have multiple sclerosis, that's a vulnerability, it's a comorbidity, um, more likely to develop depression, right? And so something with the immune system, obviously, and the inflammatory process affects people's moods, that affects the depressive kind of syndrome, and those interact. But many things that we try to modulate through all the things we learn about in ancestral health, such as increased sympathetic, you know, um, drive in our physiologies because of our modern environment, you know, stimulating our sympathetic nervous systems, you know, to the excess, um, we think about when we're working with patients. So you, you don't need to look at the detail here, but, you know, if someone has a, an affective disorder, um, what we found from that experience is that medications used to treat depression, there's groups of them that modulate physiology in ways that actually help pain. So for the appropriate case where medication is beneficial, if you modulate the mood, the pain gets better. And the pain gets better, the mood gets better, and they're interconnected. And that's where 
appreciating the interconnective nature of, you know, our physiologic makeups is, is important. So here's an example, many potions that you can use that um, can modulate the norepinephrine, you know, feedback in a, the neurocircuits in our brain that are mapping our pain transmission and how we gate pain inputs and how pain is transmitted back out to our bodies. But there's many other things that do the same types of things, whether it's meditation, whether it's that amazing movement session we just did, which helped my back. Um, dietary modifications, any, you know, all the things that we're, that we think about with ancestral health and the holistic lifestyle view. We do that with patients who are struggling with chronic pain because we, the end goal is to have multiple tools working together to help support someone um, to regain function, regain quality of life. And some people can get really debilitated by chronic pain to where it's baby steps getting people back out of this cycle that has feed, fed back on itself to um, limit, limit people's lives. Um, and as you work on this, as was mentioned by our previous speaker, you know, certain groups of people have particular vulnerabilities um, that put them at risk for developing pain. So we see this in psychiatry and have recognized, you know, conditions where this just tends to happen more often, but you can think about the physiologic vulnerabilities that would bring this together. So I remember, I don't know what year or when, and don't quote me on this, but there was a study that I found intriguing, I think many years ago, it was, they did, um, I think it was in Japan, but they, you know, in, in PE when we were kids, we had to do this uh, presidential, physical, you know, yeah. And one of the things was the sit and reach test, and then you had to like run and do a shuttle run and a long run and push-ups probably, I don't know. Anyways, but the sit and reach test. So they did a study, I think, in Japan showing that people who did better on sit and reach tests had you know, less cardiovascular disease. So perhaps people who do better on sit and reach tests just have more pliant tissues, right? I mean, I have the hypermobility kind of pliancy thing. You know, even with the bad back, you know, since I was like whatever age, I can do this not a big deal. Other people can't even touch, you know, can hardly touch their toes. And that's just how they come into the world. That's how their body developed. So if you have increased pliancy or tissues, you can imagine that your arterial arterioles are more distensible and can deal with atherosclerotic changes more effectively and prevent heart disease over time. But at the same time, you with those pliant tissues could also make you a better at being a gymnast. But at some point, pliancy becomes a vulnerability, and you could develop a chronic pain experience because of that physiologic um, predisposition. So one of those is postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, uh, POTS. This one, uh, I joked, it's like an infectious disease it's because it spread so fast, but it became, you know, certain things have been recognized, and we see that dysautonomia has become a very prevalent and uh, in terms of re being recognized as a condition, but it's been around for a long time. So you go back through medical history and dysautonomia is nothing new. It's just there's finally an appreciation for it. And we have ways that we can modulate physiology to help people who, when they try to stand up, their heart rate doesn't kick up enough, their blood pressure doesn't go enough, and they can pass out. Um, maybe their tissues are too pliant, the blood vessels pool too much blood, and they can't respond fast enough. So they're not going to get as much heart disease, but maybe they have more orthostasis, meaning they, their blood pressure variability can't match what's needed when they move positions. Anyways, this group, um, we find a lot that we can help through a psychiatry lens with the right mindset of seeing that their needs fall at the intersection of different specialties. Rheumatologists can only do so much, neurologists can only do so much, medical doctors can only do so much, and many of the people who have this constellation of uh, needs can benefit from someone being able to look at the whole picture um, and put the pieces together and realize that the symptoms and experiences they're having are real and that there's things we need to do to support um, modulating physiology in ways that can help them function. 
and ancestral health, obviously, many principles are, are relevant, okay? Um, so here's just an example of how, you, how, like, you know, I might think about um, someone with chronic pain and how changes in their autonomic nervous system, their dopaminergic function in their brain all interact in a very complex manner with their immune system and their um, you know, genetic pre predisposition and their physiologic development. And, you know, of course, all these things are interrelated. But, you know, we've had amazing talks at AHS over the years about dysbiosis and gut microbiota and the health of the, how your GI health affects your nervous system. And all this, you know, we bears out in, you know, in psychiatry. And, you know, you could, there's studies that show that, you know, if you have dysbiosis, you know, if you induce dysbiosis, by uh, irritating the colon of, you know, a study animal, uh, they are more likely to, to develop depression. If you cut the vagus nerve, and there's no way for the GI tract to transmit that uh, autonomic information to the brain, they're much less likely to develop depression. So clearly, what's going on in your gut is affecting your mood, affecting your likelihood of developing depression. But we've been talking about this since 2000, you know, 2011 here, and now these kind of topics are like, you know, ma more mainstream in the literature, which is, a, which is really great to see. So I'm just stopping with this last slide just to drive home the point that, you know, if someone is uh, caught up in the opiate epidemic and they're, they have chronic pain and they're struggling with opiates and this what you're seeing is a very complicated picture behind the scenes when you actually dig into that person's lives and what they're experiencing, what are their vulnerabilities, what are their strengths, and um, we have a healthcare system that makes it difficult for them to get their needs met, and our needs met is patients, and I, there's constantly going to be room to improve how we coordinate and tackle these more uh, nuanced interstitial medicine kind of conditions, but going back to when we started AHS, the whole point was appreciating that in order to, to take on a challenge like that, you need everyone working together, and it has to be taking inputs from people of all walks of life, from different perspectives, and trying to put the pieces together to see what are some practical tangible things that people can do in their day-to-day -day lives that can help them function and manage something like chronic pain, which is, uh, of course, a pain. Um, so this is, this is how you need to think as a doctor when you're trying to help someone with chronic pain, and also as we try to model and think about how do we uh, develop medical interventions for chronic pain. and. Um, it's complicated, but that's what makes it interesting as well. So I will stop there. <laughs> Hi, Brett. Uh, good to see you. Good to see after you. After all these years. Um, the, the reach, um, what's it called, what and reach? Uh, sit and reach. Sit test. and reach. What is that? A metric like like a good score and a bad score? Is that a proxy for some other health issues? And is it validated for children and adults? Or you don't know? I, I just I'm it, it very pertinent to what I do. Yeah. <clears throat> so the in terms of the validation, I mean, we it was the government picked it as part of their pet. You know this. These programs that used to be in the schools, it was one of the tests that they picked, obviously, to assess physical health, I guess. Um, but in terms of research protocols, this study, you know, I have to go back. I was just thinking about it today when I was <laughs> um, preparing for the talk. But, you know, it's clearly uh, measuring ability of stretch of tissues. I mean, and that's not, yes, there's some 
there's a scope of that to practice makes better, right? You do yoga, you get better yoga. But if you've ever been to a yoga studio, you know that certain people can only stretch so far. Mm -hmm. And other people, they just show up and they just stretch. So there's clearly a spectrum. Um, but in terms of use and research, I just don't know anymore, like with the formality part. But I, I view it as just a measure of tissue pliancy that it's more of a predisposition than anything, yeah. Oh, well, what you said about pain. So re reduced comorbidity for uh, heart disease was what that study showed. Oh, what? okay. Yeah, for specifically for heart disease. So then if you think about it, you know, that would, but, but uh, that group of people who also have tissue pliancy, we see joint hypermobility, ELOS, DANLOS, that whole spectrum, much higher rates of developing chronic pain and GI dysfunction, the whole constellation at the same time. So you know, I've had patients who uh, have Ehlers-Danlos, hypermobility, POTS, colonic inertia. You know, you do a, a defecation study and they have essentially no transmission of fecal material over 24 hours, right? And we've had to give them IVIG to modulate the immune system to change the immune process. And so they also have this predisposition to autoimmunity. But like it's, we noticed that this group of people has more likely to have autoimmune diseases, more likely to have these tissue pliancy kind of syndromes, and develops, you know, obviously depression and chronic pain. The, what you said about pain being a vital sign by the medical industry is the most useful thing I have heard in a long time. Thank you for that. I gotta know more about it. Yeah, yeah, you're so. welcome. Hi. <laughs> I, I love your approach of integrating, you know, different areas of specialty. So my question is, I have a 12-year-old son, and he's taking Zoloft every other day, and it's affecting his gut. Um, he's, he's had anxiety and gut issues kind of his whole life. And, um, you know, I'm looking into, like, CBT and other things to treat mm -hmm. his OCD. Um, but my question sort of is, you know, the psychiatrist is like, oh, just keep taking the Zoloft and don't worry about the gut. You know, and then somebody with a more holistic approach is like, well, you know, he's probably gained about five pounds of belly fat and he has a lot of gas and sort of, it's like, where's the balance? And is the goal to get him off the Zoloft as soon as possible? Or, you know, like, how, do, how would you approach that? Yeah, so it's a good question. But uh, so I would start with, you have to look at all the pieces of the puzzle. So if someone actually has OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder, it's one of the you know, when you think of psychiatry, like defining states in psychiatry, OCD is a condition that is like defines the field of psychiatry. If you're a neurologist, you treat seizures. Like if you see a seizure, it's a real thing. It's a physiologic thing. And there's a treatment for it. OCD, I would say, is similar. If you see someone who is manic in a manic episode, you'll realize this is a real medical condition that is very, you know. But um, so treatment for OCD, you know, standard of care is high dose SSRI, but high dose SSRI. We know that serotonin tone and affects gut function. I mean, that's basic. And some people with SSRIs, increased serotonin can have issues with affecting, you know, their, their gut health, of course. So I, the, you have to kind of try to work on both things at the same time. So perhaps uh, there's another medication that can help address the side effect of the Zoloft, you know, and I wouldn't give up on the treatment though, because there are treatments for OCD that are helpful. And it's like, you don't want to throw out the baby with the bath water. Right, and but, I've heard CBT is very Yeah, so the best that. thing for OCD is exposure and re response prevention therapy. Mm -hmm. You know, someone has to really, someone has to work with people to help them recognize their compulsions and prevent them and be able to sit with the discomfort and modulate the circuits in the brain that are on overload and are forcing people to have this need to, to do a compulsion. But um, again, it's like trying to have as many levers as you can to help treat the condition it is, is, is the best. Yeah. Thank you. Brett, hi, nice hi. to see you. Hi, good to see you. Um, so I have a follow-up on that. Um, yes. You know, through your talk, you mentioned the autonomic nervous system you know, about five times. But you never mentioned the word serotonin until just now, this yeah, last yeah. question. Um, serotonin is awfully complicated, yeah. but uh, it affects the amygdala in a big way. Mm -hmm. And the amygdala is one of the things that basically is the gate for whether pain becomes an issue of coping 
ver versus an issue of you know breakdown and yeah. um, uh, uh, activation of the HPA axis and uh, uh, you know uh, you know going out of control. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of data on serotonin and SSRIs in chronic pain syndromes, which you didn't mention. I would like you to address that question. Mm -hmm. And lastly, you mentioned cutting the vagus nerve impacts pain and certainly does, but the question is, is the serotonin in the brain coming from the gut or is it coming from de novo uh, 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 production in the brain? There is this anterograde transport yeah. because 90% of the serotonin is in your belly you know, from the, uh, your gut microbiota, and in fact, that afferent vagus is the transport mechanism to get it up to the amygdala. So, um, you know, do you want to speculate on the role of serotonin and the role of the vagus in the interpretation of chronic pain and what we as physicians can do about that? Yeah. So I can say that in practice, um, something we notice is that SSRIs, which are just geared towards serotonin. You know, these things are so complicated, obviously. But the medications used to treat that are uh, affecting serotonin are less effective for treating chronic pain experiences. So if someone has, and if you look at even just the FDA approvals for treatments of neuropathic pain syndromes, um, SNRIs are clearly in practice and in the literature uh, more effective at treating most chronic pain syndromes. And perhaps it has to do with, when you think about chronic pain, is the sympathetic overactivation um, of the chronic pain state. And um, norepinephrine being modulated by an SNRI somehow is reducing or modulating the pain transmission process, the signals that are being sent. So that's changing the pain experience because you might, you're taking in sensory information, but the way it's being, it's being transmitted to the brain, interpreted in the brain is different because of norepinephrine, the changes in the norepinephrine. Now, I don't know any further than that. I mean, that's as far as I can go to postulate. But if you have a neurocircuitry uh, that is overamplified, it's not, you know, it's, it's a signal transmission cycle. And if a pain signal is sending too frequently, the amount of signal being transduced is too high, an intervention to break the cycle or disrupt the cycle could be done by just increasing norepinephrine at the, at the synapse, and then that creates a feedback to the system and how elect electrical chemical conductance is happening to send a signal. So clearly, and, other, and TCAs, tricyclic antidepressants, which also have a norepinephrine component, are much more effective than Zoloft, Prozac, these SSRIs. So, we, so in terms of serotonin and pain, um, I in terms of just, just thinking about chronic pain syndromes generally, I'm not so sure modulating serotonin is as effective to the experience of pain because we don't see that in practice. Um, but when it comes to the gut, that's a whole different ballgame in the vagus nerve transmission. Um, you know, in patients who have... Um, either constipate, you know, so in, in some of the irritable bowel syndromes, it seems like SSRIs can be more helpful. So I think there's something unique about gut health versus just chronic pain syndromes generally. So um, that's where it's complicated. Often the people that we see with chronic pain syndromes also have GI dysfunction. And um, yeah, I, it's, I, I'm not like, um, I guess I'm not in a position to make any further scientific, but the way, I, but the thing I always go back to when I'm thinking about a patient is that this is a, this is an entire loop of information, and there are ways to modulate that loop so that um, their experience of pain is different. Thank you so much. We are now officially on break. In